Good afternoon to our panelists and to all the delegates um, attending the session. We have just an hour uh, for this session and we have five speakers who have about 10 minutes to introduce their topics. I have to apologize upfront that the time for discussion will be very tight. Um, in terms of the presentation, we will start with um, Ashley Hayes, followed by Peter Durkin, um, and Professor Leslie Scott is replacing uh, Prof. Wendy Stevens, uh, Prof. Tulio de Oliveira, and, um, and Daniel Ndima. Um, I, will, I will not go through the CVs um, of, of our panel members. Those are available um, in the program. My name is Sibongle Kumbi, and I'll be facilitating this session um, just as a way of introducing this topic, um, as Africa responds to the COVID-19 pandemic, we have experienced a number of technologies being developed in the continent. Countries such as uh, Senegal, Nigeria, South Africa, and so on, have supported local manufacturers to develop not only locally relevant diagnostics, but those that also have a global reach and will be globally competitive. These local developments have demonstrated that there exists value chains in Africa to develop the various inputs required for some of the in vitro diagnostic tests. In the management of any disease, early disease detection is absolutely critical. Thus, these in vitro tests, including point of care diagnostics are, are exceedingly important. The market opportunities for diagnostic presents a sector that is viable. With limited barriers of entry, this sector proves to be growing in the continent. In this session, you will hear from developers who are not only developing on COVID-19 diagnostics, but are using platform technologies that have a far wider reach, market opportunity, and will be of impact. It is clear that platform technologies present the most viable solutions, enabling manufacturers to pivot their technologies for other applications. I won't take up much more of your time, and uh, if we could move into our first panelist, uh, Ashley Hayes. Thank you. Yes, hi, good, good morning, everybody. Um, I'll just start my video and share my presentation. Okay. My presentation today is about medical diagnostic. Um, Hello, Nana. Are you there? Yeah, I am in the session. Okay. Um, my presentation today is about medical uh, I am in the online session. Yeah. I will yeah. come to the ICC tomorrow. Yeah. Um, apologies, because, can you- Because can I was worried about this protest. Can yeah. you perhaps uh, mute your mic? Okay, there we go. Apologies. Um, my presentation today is about medical diagnostic, a company I established in 2010. And uh, medical diagnostic was established as a developer and manufacturer of rapid diagnostic test kits. I'm a biotechnologist myself, and I've worked on the methodologies to develop um, cheap, cost-effective um, rapid tests that can be used at the point of care. Our products are robust and can withstand um, extreme conditions. Uh, we've got SAPRA approval um, on our test kits. We're currently um, going through validation to get a SAPRA approval on our COVID products. Um, but we have ISO 1345 accreditation. We've got a SAPRA medical device license. Um, we've also have WHO CE marking FDA on certain products. Um, recently, we've developed a, a fuel marker to mark um, petroleum and diesel um, using uh, cannabinoids from the cannabis plant. So we've been also exploring biomarkers. Um, we've got a team of, of experienced scientists um, heading up uh, research and development. Some of our achievements um, over the years that we, we've um, achieved, uh, Forbes recognized the company, of course, that have opened a, a, a lot of uh, business opportunities for us. Um, also UWC, I'm an old UWC graduate, uh, very proud of, of my old university. Um, then uh, the products. Uh, so of course, in Africa, you need products that can be used at the point of care. Um, and for that reason, we developed uh, methodologies whereby you can test uh, an individual using a blood sample, saliva sample, or urine sample, and you can um, obtain the results between five and 30 minutes. Um, 
The test, of course, should also be able to withstand uh, the harsh conditions in Africa. Uh, we've done a lot of stability studies to ensure that our, our assays can withstand 40 degrees for up to two years. And um, like I mentioned, we've got an ISO 13485 medical device uh, license um, and uh, some of the other accreditations I mentioned earlier. Products that we manufacture, we manufacture kits for dengue, uh, like I explained earlier, also for the motor fuel and diesel to check for paraffin adulteration, but also to see um, if uh, uh, there's a presence of biomarkers for traceability purposes. We manufacture drug tests, HIV kits, malaria, pregnancy, ovulation, schisto, and um, syphilis. The schisto test is the first urine test um, that we are aware of uh, that is currently as FDA um, accreditation. Uh, we've developed this kit uh, with the university in the Netherlands, and it's been distributed by a company called ICT Diagnostics. Uh, the sector we operate in, the medical device uh, research and development sector, manufacturing and sales, we've got 40 employees. Um, we can manufacture about 20 million test kits per annum. And also we own 51% of a company called Oculus ID. Um, current research and development projects, pending regulatory approval. We've got an, a, a COVID antibody IgG IgM test, um, very standard test. Uh, we also have a neutralizing antibody test, of course, to check the efficacy of vaccines. Um, and then also we've, uh, where we are with the, with, with the technology, uh, we're sending it uh, to the NHLS for validation and post-validation, um, hopefully we get our approval. So we do have uh, different uh, COVID products. We've got an antigen saliva test. Uh, we also now recently developed one um, for the nasal swabs, nasal swab rapid test. Um, it's performing quite well. We've done validations um, against PCR, of course, everything developed in Cape Town, South Africa. And uh, we can actually detect as low as 0.25 nanograms or more, which is quite sensitive. And it's um, comparative at this stage, uh, very close to PCR. What we've also worked on, as mentioned earlier, we've developed a, a, a THC uh, test to detect cannabinoids in petroleum. Um, the mere reason for this is because uh, the current uh, markers could be adulterated out or it could be distilled out and um, the, un the underground underworld uh, uh, also got their own methodologies of getting rid of it. What we've then discovered was that cannabinoids in the THC, um, in the cannabis plant, of course, um, cannot be adulterated out. So we've got a lot of uh, research we've done on that. We've got external validation reports and that, of course, is, is massive if it comes to uh, marking uh, fossil fuels. Then uh, we also have a, a, a product called ParaDNA uh, with a company called Genomics. It's a point of care thermocycler. Um, you can actually do PCR in the field with it. It's the device on the, on the left. And um, that is also going through SAPRA approval at this stage. We've done a lot of validations um, of the technology itself and it works quite well. What we've also recently um, validated and uh, intend on taking to market within the next six months is a product called Oculus ID. Oculus ID um, utilizes the camera. Um, we actually intend, intended on porting this to cell phones, uh, but at the time the resolution of cameras weren't uh, good enough and uh, you needed infrared light. Now, uh, these days with the technology, we've managed to, to successfully develop an Oculus uh, device. It's patented and what it does is it scans the pupils of the eyes um, and it uh, basically a flash goes off, it, it then plots a graph and based on, on the reaction of the pupil, it can then diagnose stuff like diabetes, um, but also substance abuse. So we are quite excited about this technology. Um, we do believe that it, it could play a critical role in diagnostics and first um, point of case screening. So those are the algorithms running. Um, the technology was developed in Cape Town as well. It's, uh, we own a bit, uh, we um, published the PC, uh, PCT patent for this. And yeah, that's my, my presentation on, on different types of, of diagnostic platforms that we as medical diagnostic recently developed and intend on taking to market. Um, hopefully soon we get a SAPRA approval on the COVID products and can assist in this fight. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ashley, um, for those that informative um, uh, presentation. Exciting stuff that you are doing out there in Cape Town. And I think what's also very exciting is that you're actually manufacturing the products um, yourselves uh, within um, uh, uh, the country. And I think that's a very good 
a, a way to start with um, with what you're doing. I will then um, move on to our next speaker, um, Peter Durkin, Dr. Peter Durkin. Uh, thank you. I'm just going to uh, share my screen. Okay, um, can you, is everybody able to see my screen fine? Okay, uh, right, so I am uh, Dr. Peter Durkin, I'm the Chief Scientific Officer uh, of Afrobodies. Uh, so Afrobodies is a South African-based biotech company, and we specialize in the production of the components of ACA antibodies. Uh, these antibodies are more commonly known as nanobodies. And there are two main parts to our business. One is the development uh, and production of custom nanobodies for clients. And the second part of our business is where we develop our own nanobodies uh, for projects of interest to our company. Nanobodies themselves are small biological uh, molecules. They're only approximately 15 kilodaltons in size. Uh, this size means that they're about 10 times smaller than antibodies produced by other uh, mammalian species such as humans and mice, yet nanobodies are able to maintain <clears throat> equal if not superior antigen binding properties. Nanobodies themselves, they can be produced in a wide variety of platforms such as in bacteria or yeast, um, plants or um, in mammalian cells either. When it's produced, nanobodies, uh, they display excellent uh, thermal stability properties, such as um, many nanobodies, you can heat them up to 50 degrees Celsius or more, and they still maintain their antigen binding capability. However, uh, the most uh, beneficial properties of, of nanobodies is in their adaptability. With nanobodies, you can attach a wide variety of different tags onto them, and this means that they become highly suitable for incorporation into a wide variety of uh, diagnostic platforms. And I'll just uh, show some examples of how nanobodies have been used by the diagnostic uh, sector. So uh, nanobodies uh, have been used to develop uh, highly sensitive uh, point of care detection for uh, HIV via the detection of the P24 antigen. They've also been used uh, to detect uh, animal pathogens, uh, so for diseases of livestock. And thirdly, <clears throat> and most excitingly for us, is uh, nanobodies uh, have been attached onto micro microchip um, sensors. And uh, they've been shown to be highly sensitive for detection of a wide variety of different um, molecules. Um, the microchip sensors is definitely where we see the future uh, for nanobodies and diagnostics, and it's the area where we're putting uh, a lot of our focus on going forward. I'll now just uh, uh, briefly talk about one of the projects that uh, Afrobodies is currently working on. So uh, we are working on what's called a companion diagnostic for COVID-19. Um, so for companion diagnostic, it's a uh, Combines the therapeutic element with the corresponding diagnostic. Our company has developed a range of uh, nanobodies to target the spike protein of the SARS CoV 2 virus. And, and we've had our nanobodies validated by scientists uh, in the UK and also here in, in South Africa. And they have shown that our nanobodies are uh, highly effective at neutralizing multiple variants of the virus. So Based on these results, then we decided that we're going to incorporate these nanobodies into a companion diagnostic. So uh, how is it going to uh, work? So it will work like this, basically. So for the therapeutic pillar of the companion diagnostics, we're incorporating our nanobodies into a nebulizer-based uh, treatment format. So we decided to focus on this treatment format because uh, Inhalation of the nanobodies directly into the lungs will allow uh, quick and efficient neutralization of the virus there and, stop, and, and thus stop virus propagation. Uh, the small size and stability of the nanobodies make them a candidates for this. 
And as a company, we're quite excited because we believe this will be the first uh, ever African developed immunotherapy that will be brought to market. On the diagnostic uh, pillar uh, side of the companion diagnostic, uh, some of the same antibodies that are in our, our therapeutic uh, will, will form the platform of our uh, rapid point of care diagnostic, which would be a, a microchip sensor based option. So how it would work is that the patient will turn up to the GP's uh, uh, office. The GP during the consult will take a sample from the patient. He'll run it on their uh, microchip point of care test device. And if there's a positive result at the end of the consult, then the GP will be able to prescribe uh, the, the, the nebulizer-based therapeutic that contains the nanobodies we've developed, because he or she will know that the nanobodies in our therapeutic will neutralize the virus that's present in that specific patient. So in addition to this, we're also in talks with the um, health departments about how we can link our nebulizer-based treatments uh, to be accessed by close contacts of the infected person. So um, we want the close contacts to be able to access the nebulizer treatment as well, uh, so that this will uh, act as a type of prophylactic. And yes, yeah, so we're, we're hoping that this might make a contribution to help the world get back to a sense of normalcy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Peter, uh, for that very informative and, and, and uh, a brief uh, presentation. I think what's quite exciting is how you're um, incorporating um, other digital technologies to actually advance um, the uh, usability and, and utility of, of your own uh, diagnostics. Um, I think as, the, as we move into incorporating other technologies provides for some very exciting um, avenues into other areas, um, such as now starting to incorporate artificial intelligence, starting to be more informative and informed about how to improve and, and to progress um, some of our diagnostics. Um, Professor Scott? Great, thanks, and um, good to be here. Apologies from Wendy Stevens, who's unable to attend. She had an emergency to address, uh, but I'll be able to deliver the presentation to you. And um, I'm also the head of research and development in the Department of Molecular Medicine and Hematology, based at WITS, and also work closely with Wendy on the ILEAD program, which is Innovations in Laboratory Engineered Accelerated Diagnostics. So I think from the two previous speakers are more delivery on, on diagnostics and innovations in actual products, whereas our group really sits in the, in the area of end users and implementation of diagnostics. Um, so if you really have to look at what are the things that are needed for delivering quality diagnostics? Um, we, we have to ensure that we have a good understanding um, of the needs across the pathology value chain. And what are the clinical algorithms? How will the tests be used? As well as the, uh, a good understanding of the um, current landscape and the diagnostic footprint so that you can better understand the context of where a diagnostic or a product will be used. Um, and of course, to not forget the performance evaluation and regulatory environment. Somewhat difficult to navigate if you, you know, are a first time user, but really to ensure that improved quality and ongoing um, standards are maintained within the field. So just a little bit more about the innovation opportunities. And when we think about diagnostics, we shouldn't really just think about a test or a platform. But really, it's everything that encompasses the patient, the specimen, the transport of that specimen to the central laboratory for testing, as well as getting that result back to the patient and ensuring linkage to care through a system-wide connectivity. So if you look at some of the examples that we've mentioned here on areas, such as an improved specimen collection device, uh, an improved specimen uh, stability during the transport, um, making use of multi-purpose platforms in the laboratory so that you can use technologies across different diseases. 
Um, and of course, not to forget the really transformative area of digital health technologies and the impact that that has on delivering diagnostics, uh, monitoring diagnostics across the pathology value chain, and also bringing with it accountability um, in the various steps of the use of the diagnostics. So I just wanted to share with you some of the successful innovations and that and the opportunities that we've developed for products um, in the HIV and the TB environment, which is really our background and had to rapidly trans, you know, transform it into, into COVID diagnostics. So these are some of the examples that our group have worked with, you know, simple collection devices for HIV viral load testing, the TV spot, the, the dried culture spot, which was actually a gap in African Innovation um, Award and developed here in South Africa. It's now a quality product used in 27 countries to ensure diagnostics um, and their use um, at point of care and centralized labs. The eLabs Digital Health Program really monitors um, accountability across the pathology value chain for viral loads was rapidly transferred um, onto COVID and soon to be for TB. This monitors every quality step of taking the specimen and getting the result back to the patient. The endless areas that we see in innovator, innovations around big diagnostics, big data diagnostics, uh, simple readers that improve quality of RDTs, and of course the really exciting area of the new TB diagnostic platforms that um, have been WHO approved and about to enter markets. So what are these innovations for diagnostics that we've really been involved in for COVID? Well, you can see that not only the rapid clinical trials and use case models and the performance in the field that we had to do and still do, but there's been really great innovations around developing our own reference materials, whether it's cultures, whether it's biomimetics, uh, recombinant proteins that have come from labs within South Africa, stable RNA. These are, are helping to validate technologies um, and be a standard product across all different types of, of COVID assays. But there's a lot that goes into it. And Tulio will talk a bit further about the impact of variants and what they could have in this case on diagnostics. And I mentioned ramping, ramping up the digital technology area to impact on diagnostics. And you can even see a tiny diagram there of swabs. One swab's not the same as another. We'd have to validate that, check which ones have improved performance, improved stability, and which are best. Can we even use these for self-collection uh, self and self-monitoring? So in the digital era, this is really here to stay and really to expand. There are so many areas where digital tech can, can really impact on diagnostics, where the diagnostic can be the center, but then be able to provide the results directly back to patients from bio, uh, biometrics, wearable devices. Patients may be able to have their uh, levels checked while they're wearing a device. And really, I, I can't stress more the need and importance of the digital era for, for diagnostics. So what does all this mean, though, when you come to looking at scaling and implementation? You really need to know the context. And this is in an, an era where, as you can see, I've shown the molecular diagnostics market is going to be worth billions uh, by 2026. But without getting it into the field and without implementing in the right environment, it's going to be very difficult. So here's just an example of the National Health Laboratory Services National Priority Program platforms that are available for diagnostics in the public sector. 16 uh, viral load laboratories can really generate more than 5 million tests of viral load tests per annum. The gene expert testing platform, more than 2.5 million tests per annum. These are platforms that could rapidly be leveraged for COVID testing. But if you look, the availability of these tests were not always there, not at the beginning of COVID. But something like the Allplex or the Thermo Fisher platforms, these are run on open platforms and 46% of them are currently being used. 
This is a huge opportunity for diagnostics to be developed and implemented on these technologies. And of course, where are we going into the future? We need to look at point of care testing, which COVID has certainly shown us that that's what's needed. Digital pathology and NGS for cancer, there are endless opportunities for scaled implementation and the basis is a good diagnostic. But it really needs to cover the full spectrum. We in South Africa have a hybrid model of very highly centralized laboratories all the way through to district level laboratories. But in the COVID era, we pushed this even to mobile um, vehicles, being able to provide point of care testing or even specimen collection out in rural areas. This is where diagnostics have to really cover the full spectrum. But there are complexities and I'm sure that those that are on, on the call and have presented have really witnessed some of the complexities and challenges, particularly across the pathology value chain for COVID. This is a very well um, known graph from uh, La Massa, who've really shown the disease progression of a COVID infected individual. But what's not really well understood is the thresholds of detection for both serology as, and antigen and PCR technologies. And what I liked about this presentation of this graph is really to show the windows of the false negatives. There are limits of detection, limits of sensitivity and specificity for diagnostics. And I think that is really not well understood by many developers as to what's needed, when it's required and where you can perform the test. So if you look at the pathology value chain in particular to COVID, there are complexities uh, that diagnostics are faced with. Specimen collection and stability can be a nasal swab or a pharyngeal swab, saliva. Um, these all bring with it variabilities on the actual endpoint result. The process workflows is tricky depending on the specimen type. There are various platforms and, and gene targets in the assays. And of course, access and availability is really key. So in our particular group, we've evaluated and worked with uh, diagnostic developers as well as um, help provide knowledge to SAPRA for the robust evaluation protocols. And you can see in these funnels for the different types of assays for COVID, a large input, but very few output and, and really quite tricky um, acceptance criteria that actually had to be developed way before guidelines were available. South Africa reported their first case of COVID in March 2020, guidelines for being able to help us decide which assays are, are sensitive enough and which have good performance or not, only became available from WHO in August 2020. So what happened in that gap? We had to develop our own protocols, our own materials, and our own uh, ways of evaluating. But you can see here, specifically for the molecular assays, that we've learned a lot by being able to evaluate a huge number of technologies. We've been able to also provide information to developers to highlight which are the most well-used targets, which are the better targets in the, most, in the highly performing assays whether they are available for closed systems or open systems. So it's not only on the development side of the diagnostics, but also on the evaluation side that has lent itself to lessons learned, innovative um, approaches, and certainly providing um, knowledge. So th this is not anything new to those um, uh, coming to the session today, but Really, the importance of the regulation cannot be stressed more. We know that um, SAPRA has a, a very detailed navigation protocol. We know that they follow the reliance model. And, and really, it, it is quite a tricky process and quite daunting if you have to start at the beginning where you submit your application. But as the process, and specifically for COVID, has really helped to mature this process. So from our particular aspect of, of working with companies to evaluate technologies, 
We undergo technical review with the groups. We select technologies with SAPRA, um, perform evaluations in either one of three phases, all the way through to clinical trials. Performance criteria are then reviewed and um, all along the use of target product profiles for SAPRA licensing. But it's not only on the development of diagnostics and the companies that actually stress throughout the process of um, approvals, but also on the research diagnostic side. This is just a 13 step quick view to show you that there are a lot of approval processes that, um, that need to, to go through for a particular diagnostic to be registered to even perform a clinical trial. And so it really comes down to large efforts that I think need to be um, looked at between the different uh, groups that overlap on their protocols and requirements. And I think something that can be reviewed and, and you know, made a little bit more speedy. So really in summary and some take home messages for diagnostic developers and in implementers, is that innovation is needed across the pathology value chain. It's not just individual products, but there are several along each step of the way. Processes and digital innovations really can drive diagnostics. COVID has pushed the boundaries to point of care testing and now even self-testing. Diagnostics um, have a huge potential, but they really are competitive. How do companies in South Africa go against the Roches and the Abbott's um, it's really tricky and very competitive, but scale is everything. And the feasibility, you could have a niche product or, or products in large quantities, um, but there could also be a lot of knowledge transfer uh, to South African developers. One of the areas we feel is important is also to involve the end user early in the development pipeline. Having a re reagent is only one way it is only halfway to actually getting a test to a patient. As I mentioned, the regulatory environment is maturing, but does need some balance. And post-market surveillance is really key. There needs to be ongoing monitoring from the field. The importance of partnerships cannot be stressed more, but also the right partners. And I think the platform that BioAfrica have is really great because you can see the needs across the development to manufacturers to regulation. And I think partners can certainly share their experiences. We need to strengthen the knowledge dissemination through these networks. And of course, more importantly, is think beyond COVID to other diagnostics, repurpose what we have already learned and developed. And it's just to say thanks to a multidisciplinary team that really works across the pathology value chain. And that to just stress that you know, it's fantastic to see developers doing their own innovations and being able to develop products, but there really is a huge amount of work that needs to go into actually delivering this to a patient um, in the field. So, and of course, thanks to all um, our partners and, um, and funders. And I'll hand back to you. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Scott. I couldn't agree more with your last point of thinking beyond COVID. And I think the challenges of other disease areas are, are ever present. Um, can we move on to Prof. Tulia? Yes. Uh, good day, colleagues. Good day, participants of the BioAfrica. Yeah. It's a great pleasure to be here. And I have been many BioAfricas before. And I, tomorrow I'm going to be going to the ICC and Wednesday to meet some people. But today, just to give you an online uh, presentation. My presentation will be quite short, but we'll just highlight the big, big role that genomics have in these pandemics. Yeah. So I just call genomics, diagnostic, variants, and vaccines. Yeah. Why did I start with, with, with genomics? Yeah, because genomics has been a potentially one of the most potent tools on the COVID-19 fight. It was used to discover the virus that caused the diseases. This means was used to discover through metagenomics, the SARS-CoV-2, very quick uh, from the genome to develop diagnostics and the probes 
was also used to develop vaccines. For example, both the new new platform mRNA and vector vaccines really dependent of, of the genome of the virus to be put on them. Also to track transmission, to understand virus host interaction and to evaluate variants and vaccines. Huh? So it has been an incredible work across the world with two and a half million genomes produced of SARS-CoV-2, never seen that scale and over 15,000 of those in South Africa, yeah. So what's the process that we one uses to, to develop and evaluate in the case diagnostic or genomics? And one started the RNA of the virus, and then one can go to PATH uh, once it's to test what, what uh, Wesley was mentioned was, uh, about qPCR detection and report. Now the method's really, really quick. Uh, you can do in a few hours and some new methods coming very, very fast. But you can also go the path that you would yeah, transform the RNA on a, on a reverse transcriptase PCR that's in the top. You would amplify, you would prepare the library, and then you would uh, do sequence and analysis. And that's a massive like developing on that area. And also in South Africa, and now we can go from sample to a whole genome within a couple of days. Yeah. So what we did in this pandemic, uh, the first thing that we did is to set up a, a network, and that was incredible. We got eight different universities working with eight labs in the NHLS distributed across the whole country to do genomic surveillance in real time. First time that we come in such a large network, we call that the Network of Genomics uh, uh, Surveillance, that was funded by the Department of Science, Innovation and, and Medical Research Council, and allows South Africa to discover many things and many very quick. For example, the first wave, we identify which lineages uh, start the third wave, not only which lineages, but how they enter in South Africa and how they spread across the country. That was a, mess, uh, a major knowledge which, which could see like, for example, strains that arrive here in Durban, yeah, is spreading very quick or new introductions arrive in Johannesburg and going through the highway to, or the freeway to Durban. Eh? So we could really start tracking uh, uh, genomics, uh, how the virus spread in South Africa in real time. On the second wave, many of you will be aware, we detected the first variant of concern in the world, which became then the beta variant. We also helped the UK to identify their own variant in Brazil. So South Africa really led on that area of very quick um, identification of these new variants. But the whole objective is not only identify, but really understanding at the protein structure, what the mutations happen and what's the effect. Uh, so South Africa also did uh, very well on, on, on that area. Once we have detected the variant, we have set up um, uh, assays such as pseudovirus with, uh, together with a penny more at the NICD or live virus that you could grow the variants yeah, in, in, in a very high high secure uh, laboratory, a P3 plus lab, and then you could ask question, does the vaccines that are being trialed neutralize the beta variant? And in the case here <coughs> with the Oxford AstraZeneca, the answer is that large number of loss of neutralization, three quarters of, of the virus tested could not be, the plasma from vaccinated could not neutralize this variant. And that was important and consistent about live virus and pseudovirus to determine which vaccines were used in South Africa. I did that together with a colleague of mine, Professor Salim Abidou Karim. We, we organized all the data that have been produced, all, both in the pseudovirus and the live virus plaque assay in South Africa, and allow to put in an order of what would be the most effective vaccines to be used in South Africa, with in the case the Pfizer and, and the Johnson Johnson having a lower decrease of neutralization and be effective against the beta variant and now against the Delta variant. So this is data that's been developed in real time in South Africa. What also allow, it allow uh, uh, South Africa and the labs in South Africa to become some of the biggest leaders on understanding the effects of vaccines on variants. So that's just a piece that, that, that came in, in nature highlighting how South Africa become one of the biggest um, players on that field 
the NIH director that Franz Collin highlighted South Africa as the, one of the examples in the world to, of the power of genomic surveillance to be, to be used. And then the idea what we are trying to do here through a network is not only uh, evaluate other vaccines or identify variants or publish big papers. The idea it is to try to have the tools in South Africa that we can challenge one of the big status quo, yeah, is that to start producing diagnostics and vaccines in South Africa. We have been very fortunate, a network of universities together with the Africa CDC, BioVac and Afrigen, which um, I coordinate the research program, yeah, managed to win from the World Health Organization a big competition to set up the first COVID mRNA vaccine technology transfer hub in South Africa. And one of the main reasons to that, in addition of the companies, it was this very basic science that could take vaccines that have been developed and test that in real time, which both identify variants, but also test the effect of the vaccines on neutralization, which is going to really help the country to try to become a player on the development of vaccines and diagnostics. So just to conclude, genomic surveillance, a critical component of the public health response, it really grow in, in importance with COVID, was, was used to identify the virus, develop diagnostic vaccine, detect variants. South Africa has, has excelled, excelled in the genomics scientific research and received major investment from major funders around the world, which now we, we help to set up a genotype to phenotype in real time in South Africa, which is allowing the country to compete to become one of the first production hubs of mRNA vaccine. And this technology will also help to development and evaluation of diagnostics. Uh, thank you very much. And just passing back to the chair of our session. Thank you. Thank you uh, to you. I see we're uh, starting to slightly run out of time. So I'll hand over immediately to uh, Mr. Ndima from Cape Biotechnologies. Thank, thank you, Chair. And uh, I think I will be uh, uh, very quick. I don't know if you can see my screen, right? Yes, we can see it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, uh, thank you to, to you and uh, my fellow panelists. Uh, I'm Daniel Ndima, uh, the CEO of a, a, a biotech company uh, that is based in St. Chiron, Pretoria. Uh, we, we are basically... Um, a, a, a company that was started as a project uh, by the CSR through the support of the Department of Science and Innovation in around 2015. We uh, launched this project in order to respond to obviously the shortage of reagents that we we use in our healthcare um, uh, uh, you know responses, uh, including diagnostics, uh, and really. You know, we launched a pro uh, the, the, the company as a private uh, entity using uh, uh, private investments around 2018. Uh, but most importantly, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we started really making inroads, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, in the US and, and, you know, formalizing some form of partnerships that are helping us to, to develop technologies that can really be competitive. But we also have key technology partners uh, in South Africa that also include the CSRR. Uh, you know, our products now are in uh, more than 10 uh, countries, including Canada, US, those are just key ones. And we are currently looking at five uh, key markets uh, in Europe, that will be German, uh, French, Italy, UK, uh, and, um, and Spain. So we, we, we really are seeing uh, the uptake of our products. These products are, are sort of by prospected from our indigenous biodiversity hotspots, uh, the Cape Biosphere or the Cape Flora Kingdom. This is where the brand or, or our brand comes from, the Cape Bio rich in diversity comes from. Uh, we have developed a, a proprietary biodiscovery platform that allow us to be able to search for best in class enzymes. And we are able to uh, use our proprietary biomanufacturing uh, platform, which was licensed from the CSR in order to produce these products at uh, industrial scale. Uh. You know, our, our, our purpose uh, uh, as a company 
uh, is basically to make sure that we, 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 we present innovations that are coming out of Africa for Africa's benefit and beyond. Uh, we, I will be presenting a bit about our current platform. It's a, a reverse transcriptase quantitative piece, uh, polymerase chain reaction uh, platform. I think Prof Scott was presenting about some of the assays or kits that are developed using the same platform. Uh, we, we use these basically for uh, RNA-based uh, uh, detection uh, of you know, you know, viruses that, that, are, that have nucleic acid of RNA uh, uh, format uh, via PCR route. And this platform is suitable for detecting other uh, uh, viral related uh, uh, viruses. And this is where now we are able to expand the repertoire in terms of diagnostic development uh, uh, in South Africa. We have a, a, what we call a master mix or ready mix, which now uh, sort of uh, propels us for development of a wide range of diagnostics that are based on RNA detection. Uh, just to show you an example of what I'm talking about here. So what this is the a COVID-19 sample that was analyzed uh, in our laboratory just for, 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 for the purpose of this presentation, just to show that we have seen uh, uh, quite a different uh, performance uh, you know, uh, outlook of our product. Uh, that shows that uh, any higher viral loads may, may be about uh, you know, uh, uh, 10,000 copies uh, per meal the CT values always come uh, before the internal control, which is human RNA-SP, while the, 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 the low copy numbers often come after, after this, uh, this, this, this threshold, uh, which, of which our cutoff is around 37 uh, of CT value. We also produced our own control, which is very important in a diagnostic uh, landscape. What we have seen as well through interaction with uh, the current customers, the end users of this product, is that they require that we package our products uh, uh, in master mix format so that uh, you know there's a reduced uh, uh, workflow uh, in terms of pipetting and all that so we uh, are able to customize uh, accordingly to ensure that we don't uh, disrupt the, the the efficiency of the workflow but instead we improve it uh, significantly so what this does is that it helps us uh, uh, you know to have a lesser reliance on imports, uh, as, as Prof. Scott was saying, that you know, there's these big players in the industry uh, that have been dominating for quite some time. Uh, but what, it, what this does uh, is that it, it allows us to have a quick response to this outbreak in our, on our continent so that we don't really rely uh, on foreign imports. But more so, it also saves us on our currencies. Uh, being a local company it means that we are closer to our clients. We are able to help them uh, to optimize uh, uh, their protocols. We are able to help them, you know, have uh, uh, you know access to these uh, important re uh, reagents. But more so, what this platform does is that it has helped us to really create jobs that are you know very desperately uh, needed in the industry. Uh, and to, it helps us to now start to expand the value chains, you know, and and make sure that. Uh, other role players are, uh, actually come through uh, uh, to assist to expand, uh, uh, you know, the industry's capabilities. I think uh, Prof. Tulia was speaking about some of these capabilities that they have initiated. So what we are, are doing basically is a complement is a is a complementing uh, uh, service to some of the work that uh, Prof. Scott and and and, and Prof. Uh, uh, Tulia was speaking about earlier. But what we have also developed is another platform that is DNA based. Uh, we call it Cape Tech IVD. Uh, this is now uh, uh, you know, a diagnostic tool that can now detect DNA based viruses or DNA based detection. We're still optimizing this uh, as well. And this, 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 this uh, platform can also be used uh, in a forensic, in a DNA forensic uh, uh, applications. So, the most important thing about you know, the feature of IVD is, is that, you know, we, we tend to look at human benefits uh, in terms of these, these tools, but we also have animals that one needs to take care of, uh, including our own environment in terms of the issues, making sure that we live in a healthy and safer environment. In terms of the market, I think uh, uh, there's a lot that was extrapolated from the previous presentations, but my, my, my interest here, or what I wanted to highlight here, is, is exactly what Prof. Scott was saying about the point of care diagnosis, which is a segment that is uh, rapidly growing globally, uh, and we can see that uh, uh, you know in, in terms of the uh, you know the market share, this is this is starting to take off uh, uh, you know quite rapidly. Though the, the the molecular diagnostics is quite an important one, and we can see in terms of the the, the, the growth rate, uh, we also see that you know the, the the point of care diagnostics are, are starting to 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 take some form of of shape. 
But what you want to wanna highlight here as well is that, you know, uh, what is driven the market is uh, actually infectious diseases. And, and Africa is prone to quite unique sets of infectious diseases. And I think as a company, we would like to place ourselves together with our partners, including those that wants to partner with us in order to expand the testing uh, capabilities uh, for the continent. What I'm, what I'm trying to drive here is that, you know, going forward, you know, this process that you see here where you have uh, sample collection, I think Prof. Scott speaking about it, and nucleic acid extraction, amplification, et cetera. This is going to be integrated into what we call uh, um, lab on chip uh, point of care uh, molecular diagnostics, where you will uh, basically insert a sample, inside that sample basically, or inside of device, you, you basically have the entire lab basically operating and you are able to integrate that with a, a mobile device. Uh, uh, Chair, I, want, I, I say that I didn't want to waste your time, but let me close off here by saying that, you know, when you look at uh, IVDs, IVDs in general, this is, uh, these are very critical and essential tools uh, for, 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 for making sure that we have uh, adequate and, 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 and safer vaccines and other therapeutics that are required for our healthcare. So if you want to uh, uh, sort of uh, be able to respond to this kind of crisis, one would look at ensuring that, you know, there's sort of, a, a, you know, a, a platform that allows for, for, for multi-channel or multi-purpose uh, uh, detection of uh, uh, infectious diseases uh, uh, and among other, other, other testing uh, capabilities. Uh, these are our partners, uh, our investors, our partners in the US, uh, uh, you know, Canada, we've got distributors locally. We work quite well with our government as, as, we, as we regard uh, the, the projects that we undertake uh, very vital for, 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 for our, our local industry. Thank you very much. Uh, I think I will end. I will end there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Daniel, for enhancing and enlightening us. Enlightening us. Certainly not time wasted at all. So thank you for the presentations of this afternoon. Um, just, I, I didn't fully introduce myself at the beginning of this of the session. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of a company called Smart Biotech, and part of the reason why I was invited um, by BioAfrica to to um, to facilitate this session was that is that we have just entered into agreement with uh, Global Access Diagnostics that's based in the UK to collaborate on the supply distribution and most importantly technology transfer of their COVID-19 antigen rapid diagnostic test in South Africa. Um, this is a unique and exclusive partnership as it not only looks at the access and availability of the latest COVID antigen RDT, but more importantly, that these diagnostics are affordable uh, for the country. Um, the, the, the COVID-19 test produced by Global Access Diagnostics, or GAD, is one of the best in the world for sensitivity and specificity as well as providing fast and accurate results for wide scale uh, testing. So this is quite an exciting uh, time and opportunity uh, for us. We will start with just dis distributing finished product for an initial period with a plan to back integrate through a technology transfer process towards manufacturing uh, the diagnostics in South Africa. We believe this will bring a far more sustainable solution to managing uh, the pandemic as well as building manufacturing capacity and ensuring security of supply. Um, for the country. So I'd like to thank our panel members, uh, especially for keeping their presentations nice and short and very informative despite the time uh, limitations. Uh, we have had a balance of presentations, first from the diagnostic companies introduce, who are introducing and producing a wide range of relevant uh, diagnostics. We also have heard from uh, research institutions involved in developing platform technologies as well as supporting R&D uh, work to improve the effectiveness of the diagnostic space through providing more information that we need. And I think this speaks to um, what uh, 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 Prof. Scott said, uh, uh, mentioned in one of his slides earlier about the innovation opportunities that exist, capturing the full value chain for an effective diagnostic uh, landscape. I'm going to perhaps open up for questions. We don't have much time left if we've got about five minutes. Um, if there are any uh, questions from uh, the audience that's attending this session. I did invite uh, questions in the chat. I'm not sure if, there's, if there is any.
Maybe to quickly uh, pose a question to, first to those who are involved in, 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 in the, as, as entrepreneurs, how has the current environment um, and especially investments and, and resources that have been um, directed towards uh, COVID, which has generated other opportunities, how has that had an impact in terms of um, opportunity, business opportunities in your uh, respective uh, enterprises? And then for those who are largely involved in research, what has that meant from a, an R&D perspective in terms of the available resources, the available opportunities, and what are those kind of opportunities that have opened up for you recently? Thank you. Maybe start with Ashley, who started us off uh, this afternoon. Hi, uh, apologies. Can you repeat the question again? Was, uh, the question, Ashley, is um, given the recent, um, with COVID, there have been a lot of resources that have gone into um, R&D, into new business opportunities, new enterprising opportunities. Um, has the current environment in terms of the resource, the amount of resources allocated to COVID, has there been any spin-offs that you've experienced as a company as a result of the current environment that we're in where there's a lot more um, uh, alertness and awareness of the importance of, of new innovations for fighting diseases? Yeah, um, yeah, definitely. Firstly, uh, we got a grant fund from uh, the, the Department of Science and Innovation by the SAMRC. So that assisted in developing some of the technologies. Um, a limiting factor that I would say is uh, the, the availability um, to access samples, actual clinical samples. That was a big um, uh, hurdle for us to overcome. And um, we've managed to do clinical trials through a, a clinic. So the hospitals, um, however, assisted us in, in getting enough data uh, to be able to submit to SAPRA now. So in a, in a nutshell, in terms of funding availability, yes, uh, there are funds available. In terms of spin of opportunities and, new, and, and products in the diagnostic space, we had a surge in sales and other things. Um, but of course, uh, the limiting factor for us was accessibility to samples. Thanks, Ashley. Um, any other responses? Um, Tifangile, maybe I can just jump in here quickly from the research side. I must say that the recent months of COVID have really increased our efforts tremendously. And if I just reflect back, you know, it took about 15 years for WHO to recognize the critical need of uh, HIV viral load testing for monitoring of, of HIV. Um, it took about two to three years for us to validate and get WHO input on gene expert testing for TB diagnostics, but it took two months for us to rapidly implement uh, COVID diagnostics on similar platforms. So one thing that we have experienced is, is really the rapid rate at which things had to be done and the knowledge base that has really come from this. So. I'm not saying pandemics are good, but it certainly has encouraged the research, has encouraged the R&D. And from the developers' side, we've seen huge efforts on, on manufacture needs and innovation, and it just mustn't stop here. Yeah. Daniel, we've seen a lot of you in the media in the last 18 or so months. Do you have any comments? Thanks, Chair. I, I wanted to call, to also, uh, uh, you know, have a few words here. I think, you know, if if you if you if your research project is um, strategically looking at, you know, the future of the industry, or or, or, or you you position yourself quite strategically, uh, and you have interactions with, uh, 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 you know, funders, and they are able to buy in into your idea. And they understand exactly what you want to do, uh, and they know that you uh, you are passionate about it, and you you you, you know you'll never stop until you make it happen. Uh, you know, investors look at at, at the person, uh, and 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 they marry those two with the technology. Uh, and I've seen that uh, when we first went to the US and spent a couple of weeks, and we were just doing 
uh, you know, a talk to a few investors and they were quite excited with the innovation that we're coming with. And you see that the US is, 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 is mostly happy with the new thing. If you have something that is quite unique with us, they were saying for the first time we, we see a technology like these or enzymes that are produced out of Africa, leveraging on African indigenous microbial hotspots. This was quite a big thing. Uh, uh, for, 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 for them, and, and they, were, they were happy to take us on. However, I have to say that uh, locally, uh, investment in R&D is quite scarce, uh, especially coming from the private sector. Uh, but, you know, you see that the moment you have, uh, you, know, uh, you know, certain successes like we had recently of getting uh, SAPRA approval, you start to see a lot of uh, commercial investors coming through and saying, you know, how can we help? And, and this is this is their uh, uh, this is opportunity, uh, but uh, R and D is quite a risky kind of a, a, a puzzle. Uh, uh, you may have ten projects, and then you find that none of them work. Uh, you know what do you do thereafter as a private investor. So so that's where we need to have an integration between uh, uh, you know interconnection between the, the private investment and, and the state uh, uh, you know funding. And we are fortunate in this project that. Uh, we had TIA, SAMRC, and DSI funding this project, but our investors were also coming through, and they put quite a substantial amount of, of, of funds to this project, uh, helping uh, uh, this national response. So, uh, you know, the opportunities are there if, if you know exactly what you want to do, uh, uh, but you also need to make sure that you're able to navigate and leverage on other uh, uh, investments uh, abroad, because there's so many people that want to come and invest in Africa. Thanks, Daniel. I think you've had an inspiring journey um, uh, bringing uh, Cape Bio to the fore. Um, Peter Durkin, I wonder if you could answer just maybe we need to close soon. There's this one question. What are the challenges in terms of accessing the right skills for diagnostic startups locally? Um, Peter, maybe if I can uh, direct that question to you. Uh, <clears throat> yeah. Um, so by, by and large, um, the, the universities in South Africa do a pretty good job in um, in training the people. So there is um, most for our business anyway uh, all the skills that we need by and large. I can source them here in South Africa, so that's uh, a, a positive part of it. Um, we're running into well, one of our biggest issues though is uh, with the microchips. There's nobody in South Africa that can do this uh, work, so I'm having to work with people uh, abroad. Um, but these, it, it is what it is, and as Daniel says, without investments, like you know, we you're talking like hundreds of millions of rands that really need to be invested to make a difference. Like, um, so we'll, we'll see how it goes. Hopefully, it, it, it will happen, and uh, more of the private sector will come in on board to, to develop these things. Thank you very much. It looks like we've run out of time. I'd really like to thank uh, Bio Africa for putting this all together and putting such an amazing uh, panel of members uh, with diverse experience and coming from uh, different uh, uh, areas uh, covering the full value chain as far as uh, the diagnostic landscape is concerned. And to all those who have joined us for this session, it's been wonderful to have you uh, uh, join us and I hope you found it as, um, as interesting and as enlightening as, as I have and I've enjoyed uh, uh, chairing this session. So to everyone, thank you, and I hope you'll, you'll stay on to listen to more of this afternoon's session. Have a good afternoon and good day to everybody. Thank you.